I'd like to talk to you today about biodiversity in LA, about the, the biodiversity that we have now and the biodiversity that we might have in 2050. I'm gonna focus on animals because animals are what I work on and frankly, I think animals are about the coolest thing we have. So I wanna start with a very kind of, couple of basic uh, thoughts. The first is that you may or may not know this, but we live in one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. A recent assessment placed LA in the top 35 places on Earth in terms of importance for maintaining and conserving biodiversity. It's because we have a very rich set of species that live here and we have an enormous number of problems. So we are in a true global biodiversity hotspot. The second is that even though we manage everything else in this city, we do not manage our biodiversity in any way, shape, or form. And I would argue that we should. We should manage it very closely and very carefully. Now, before I tell you how I think we should, um, let, let's look at a few species and some of the biodiversity that we have in the city. And, and it's amazing. It is truly astonishing. We have you know, iconic individuals and species like P22, the mountain lion that, that uh, managed to get into Griffith Park. We have coyotes that are you know, common across our suburban backyards, but they're also common in downtown, right in the heart of the city, big, big carnivores like, like coyotes. We have familiar species like opossums. We have, in my mind, marvelous and beautiful species like these alligator lizards that were in my own backyard in West LA. Um, and wall lizards, like this one. We have iconic, gorgeous species like red-tailed hawks or yellow-headed parrots. And we have just bizarre species like this horned lizard from LAX or these clawed frogs. Now, if you know anything about biodiversity, one of the things you might have noticed is that some of the species I've shown you are native. They evolved here, they belong here, they're supposed to be a part of the fabric of our local environment. And some of them aren't, like this clawed frog is from South Africa, and somehow, in some way, it got established in waterways of Southern California. Um, why we have this mixture of native and non-native species, and in particular, why non-natives seem to do so well in urban environments is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, to understand, and, and it's because of this. So when we build our cities, we don't build them for wildlife, we build them for ourselves. We build them for our pleasure and, and enjoyment. And one of the things we do is we create all these weird, novel, new environments, things that weren't here and that local species never evolved to cope with. I mean, palm trees are a great example, right? There weren't any native palms in LA before we showed up. Now they're all over the place. and there are no native species that are specialized on palm trees, but there's lots of non-native ones. And eventually, just due to luck and circumstance, they show up and they populate our city and our palm trees. Sometimes native species do that, sometimes non-natives do. I'll give you an example. So, so here's some Vox's swifts. This is a, a native species, and they like, they like cliffs to, to uh, perch on. Well, there kind of weren't a lot of cliffs around, but um, they've discovered that these abandoned chimneys um, from old factories serve them very, very well as cliffs. And so now, this time of year, you can see big, beautiful flocks of Vox's Swifts in downtown LA. Other times, we create other novel environments and other species come in. A green lawn in LA is a totally novel environment. There should not be anything like this here, and species move in to fill the gap. Um, we should expect this, and this will happen. The key here is that we never planned for it. We didn't plan for those swifts. We didn't plan for these pigeons. We built our environment, and species showed up. And we can do better than that, and we should do better than that. Here's a couple of kind of uh, very simple ideas as we think about being much more proactive in managing biodiversity in our city. The first is, is that this is just a basic from evolutionary biology and conservation biology. We should do everything we can to promote native species living in our city. That's always first. However, we also have to recognize that we create lots of novel, habit novel habitats 
And those novel habitats frequently are not going to be occupied by native species. They just don't have the wherewithal to, to uh, handle those habitats. And this is where it gets interesting, is that given that we've created those novel habitats, I think we can manage and actually promote to have for species to live in those novel habitats that we want here, rather than just sitting back, abdicating responsibility, and letting what comes in come in, and then just sort of saying, oh well. And, and here's the really radical sort of proposal, and I can't believe I'm saying this as a conservation biologist, but we might want to think about, in some cases, intentionally introducing species that we want here, rather than waiting to see what shows up and living with the consequences. What species do we want to live here? Well, I know what I want to live here. I want non-native species here that are endangered in their home habitat, that are probably going to go extinct, but that best available science tells us could thrive in Los Angeles. LA could serve as, as, as a sort of safety zone for those species to ensure that at least at the global level, they don't go extinct. So those are the species I want to have as non-natives in our city. That's a nice idea. So is it possible? And the answer is absolutely. I'll give you a couple of examples. So I study reptiles and amphibians. This green and gold bell frog is a spectacular species of frog native to southeastern Australia, um, area around Sydney. And it is tanking badly and is probably going to go extinct in Australia. A hundred years ago, for no particularly good reason, these things were introduced into New Zealand and they are thriving in the North Island of New Zealand. Another example closer to home, um, red crowned parrot, also sometimes called the green cheeked parrot, is down to about a thousand individuals in northeastern Mexico, which is its home range. There are 2,500 of them, two and a half times as many, living within the greater LA basin, primarily in the San Gabriel Valley. Both this parrot and the previous frog are probably not going to go extinct at a global level. And the reason why they're not going to go extinct is because they were introduced into other places and they're thriving there. So this can really work. Now, in both of these cases, it was just luck and circumstance. This happens to be a popular bird, a cage bird. They got loose and they established themselves. It wasn't done by design. I think if we're going to do it by design, there's a couple of things we need to figure out and uh, think of these as challenges. The first big one is we have to know what lives in LA or in any major city. We have to know what's here now and what isn't here now. And by knowing that, we can understand why they're here and why they survive. Now, you might think we know the animals that live in our city and you'd just be dead wrong, okay? Um, I think the solution to how we figure this out is what's known as citizen science. We have four million people living in this city. That's eight million eyes. And if we could get a bunch of those eyes focused on animals and plants that are in backyards, neighborhoods that you see on your commute, we can capture that information and we can use it to document what lives here in what neighborhoods and what, and what doesn't. And just to give you one example of how this works, my colleague Brian Brown at the LA County Museum of Natural History set out about 30 insect traps in backyards around LA. And in one small little group of flies that he happens to be a specialist on, Brian discovered 43 species new to science, never known to exist anywhere on the planet, described all of them from within the city limits of Los Angeles. Now, if that's the level of lack of knowledge that we have about the biodiversity in our city, there are probably thousands of species that are new to science and probably tens of thousands of species that are here that we don't even know about. And we need to understand that. The second thing or challenge that we, that we need to meet is we need to understand how the things, the species that do live here manage within our city. How do they navigate it? Okay, we know how we do, how do they do it? You look at that, there's a, just a screenshot of downtown LA. There's freeways, there's major roads, there's minor roads, there's houses, there's factories, there's shopping malls. There's a whole complicated network of environments in Los Angeles. And we need to know how those 
flies, how those lizards, how those possums navigate the city. How do they move through it? What do they view as a barrier? What do they view as, as a corridor? Or you can put it in another way. Here's a coyote. This is downtown on Temple Street. Okay. Um, and the question is, does that coyote view that street as a corridor like we do to help it move around the city? Or does it view it as a scary impediment that keeps it from moving? Okay. Now, figuring that out is hard. And I think the best way to do it is using genomics, what we might call urban landscape genomics. So there's a tremendous amount of information in the DNA of every person in this room and every animal living in LA that tells us a great deal about how animals move, corridors that they use for movement, impediments to movement, basically sort of how they navigate the city and how they make a living. We do this kind of work in my lab a great deal. Tom Smith does it in his lab. There's a number of us here at, L at UCLA who work at this level of using sort of very detailed cutting edge genomic science to learn about how animals and plants move around. You combine these two, citizen scientists to tell us what lives in our city and what doesn't and where, and genomics to tell us how those species navigate, how they make a living in our city, how they move around. Between those two, you can start putting together a very clear picture of what species should live here, what species could live here, and which species won't. That is, we can build predictive models of the species of the future. We can then use that information to make responsible choices about the non-native species in particular that we want to have in our city that'll do the most for conservation biology. So finally, one might ask, well, why bother with all of this? What's the point? And to me, that's the point right there. Um, if we can have an LA in 2050 or in 2020, that looks more like this, that's just bristling with cool animals, with wonderful biodiversity. It makes it a richer, more engaging, more interesting place to live. It makes it a living laboratory for our kids in our schools. And it makes it a place that we can feel proud of because we're promoting native biodiversity and we're also doing the right thing by perhaps saving a few species that might otherwise go extinct. And I think that's a great model. Thanks a lot.